Good afternoon. My name is George Lemieux, and I have the privilege of being the chairman of the Gunster Law Firm. On behalf of myself, Bill Perry, our managing shareholder, our board of directors, and all of our attorneys and team members at the Gunster Law Firm, we welcome you to today's webinar. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, you will be able to view this webinar because we're recording it, and you can view it on Gunster's COVID-19 website, and it will be available starting tomorrow morning. You can go to www.gunster.com, that's G-U-N-S-T-E-R.com forward slash COVID-19. Feel free to share the webinar with others. You can find additional timely information and resources there as well. I encourage you to submit any questions you have this afternoon. There's a Q&A feature on your screen. Questions will be sorted and read aloud. We will not read your name. We'll read, do those anonymously and we'll give those to the most appropriate attorney to answer. Questions that we don't get to today live on the webinar uh, will be addressed in our client alerts, which are also posted on the COVID-19 portion of our website at gunster.com forward slash COVID-19. Additionally, if you would like to ask questions that you can't get to today, or you wanna uh, ask those questions and get one-on-one -on -one feedback, you can email us at COVID-19 at gunster.com. That's COVID-19 at gunster.com. Lastly, we have another site that's dedicated to the CARES Act, specifically on our webpage, where you can find some of the forms and information that we're gonna reference today. It is gunster.com forward slash CARES Act, and it has a hyphen between CARES, C-A-R-E-S hyphen act, gunster.com forward slash CARES hyphen act. Let me give you, before we uh, start on the CARES Act today, a little information about where we stand in Florida. Uh, as of 11 a.m. this morning, we've had 13,324 people with a confirmed positive COVID-19 test. And unfortunately, we've had 236 uh, fatalities. In the United States, there are about 331,000 cases. So these numbers are going up. Florida now is number two in the country for testing. So we are gonna get more positives as we test more people. But that, although it's ironic, is good news because once we've tested people and know whether they have it or they don't have it, we can then quarantine the people who have it, get them the health care they need, and put them in a position where they can recover, hopefully, and not spread it to other people. So the fact that you see the numbers going up, I know is disheartening, but it's better that we're testing and knowing than not testing and knowing. And now Florida is number two in the country in testing. Another piece of, of good news for you is that on March 30th of this year, hospital admissions in Florida hit 177. And since then, they've been going down. Uh, there was just 85 new admissions on Sunday. So we are hopeful that perhaps we've uh, peaked on hospital admissions. We'll have to see in the coming days and weeks. As the guidance we've gotten from the federal government is, these next two weeks are critical and everyone is encouraged to uh, stay at home when they can, only work at essential businesses when they must, only visit essential businesses with proper protective gear and do the best you can to not be in a position where you're gonna get the COVID-19 or spread it to others. So we're cautiously optimistic. We are gonna get through this. And today we're gonna provide you with the information you need under this extraordinary package which has been passed by the United States government, uh, a package with more than $350 billion available to small businesses under the payroll protection program. We're gonna go through that today. We're gonna answer your questions and tell you about the details about that, as well as provide some information about Florida relief programs, uh, and also talk to you about uh, employment and uh, issues that concerning new legislation that's passed uh, under the CARE Act, and other labor and employment topics uh, that are important to you as you run your businesses. First, let me turn it over to uh, my colleague, Adi Rappaport. He's a shareholder in our tax department. He's the chair of our tax department at the Gunster Law Firm. He practices out of our West Palm Beach office. And Adi is gonna walk through with you uh, the, the federal program, the payroll protection program, as, as well as another federal program, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, uh, and help you understand both of those programs as you seek to apply 
for the relief that is provided. A D. Portion of my presentation relates to federal loans available through the SBA under both the PPP program and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan programs. The PPP program is the cornerstone of the CARES Act for small businesses. As George mentioned, it uh, appropriates $349 billion for loans that may be forgivable, and we'll go through the details uh, of those loans. Based on the questions uh, that we've already gotten in and understanding the large number of people are tuned into this webinar, there's going to be uh, a huge uh, group of people who are watching and understanding this loan program for the first time, and then there's a good number of people who have already dug into all the details and have very specific questions. And we'll try to balance both of those things out. Uh, there's been a flurry of activities with respect to this program over the past week. Uh, last Thursday, the SBA first issued the loan application for borrowers. Uh, there were also interim rules that were issued on Thursday, and then there was also rules issued over the weekend relating to how affiliation works and guidance to faith-based uh, organizations. So some fundamental things about the payroll protection program, it's an expansion of what's known as the 7A program under the SBA that was historically only for small businesses. And small businesses could use that money for land acquisition, uh, development, capital improvements. And what the payroll protection program did was significantly expand the number of businesses that are eligible, which we'll talk about shortly, and also narrowed how the money can be spent. And we'll talk about that too. So who is eligible for this program? It's businesses with fewer than 500 employees. However, in certain industries, that threshold is increased and you have to go to the SBA website to figure out if you're in one of those industries. Uh, you have to be in operation on February 15th of 2020. Uh, and you have to make certain certifications uh, relating to the loan application, which I'll talk about shortly. There are affiliation rules. For a lot of businesses, this will not be an issue. You will just know that based on your payroll, uh, and uh, my partner Joe Santoro will discuss how you count number of employees, but you will know pretty easily that you're under the 500 threshold. Some industries, uh, the act allows you to ignore affiliation. It's called the waiver of affiliation rules. And those industries are primarily hospitality and food service industries. In those situations, you can count your workforce based on physical location and not aggregate based on all of your locations. So if you have a business structure, we have a holding company and multiple subsidiaries, and those subsidiaries all have workers, uh, you need to consider whether those different subsidiaries would need to be consolidated under the affiliation rules. Uh, and that is something that we've given a lot of thought to over the past week. In addition, I mentioned that every applicant is going to have to make certifications on their application. Those certifications include, one, that current economic conditions make the loans necessary to support ongoing operations. And another one that's worth noting is that funds will be used to retain workers and maintain payroll or make mortgage interest payments, lease payments, and utility payments as specified under the PPP. And that certification goes on to say, I understand that if the funds are knowingly used for unauthorized purposes, the federal government may hold me legally liable, such as for charges of fraud. So you need to seriously consider your eligibility for the loan and making these uh, certifications. And we would advise that you prepare, at least internally, an analysis of why your business needed the loans and how it plans to apply the money so you have uh, backup substantiation for those certifications. Uh, the size of the loan is capped at $10 million, but it's generally calculated at two and a half times your total monthly payroll costs. 
And payroll costs are salaries, wages, cash tips, payments for vacation, parental, family, medical, or sick leave, group health care benefits, as well as certain other employment-related expenses. Uh, there are some questions that have already come in into our Q&A relating to uh, a certain limitation. So the statute provides that you cannot take into account salary or compensation in excess of $100,000. And there's been questions as to whether that $100,000 is based only on salary or whether it's an all-in number based on total compensation. Uh, the statute is not clear on this point, uh, but based on the guidance that the SBA has issued and the way the instructions for the loan application have been drafted, it seems like the better answer is that you cap people at over 100,000 at 100,000, not just salary, but total compensation. I certainly understand that there's other guidance out there and, there, and this is a situation where the Treasury could certainly provide more guidance. Uh, another question is, over what period of time do you determine the payroll amount? And the actual legislation says it's the 12 months before loan origination. The application says you can use 2019 payroll. Uh, the application takes a very practical approach, uh, in my opinion, because most employers at this point will have all those uh, payroll reports already completed and filed. And keep in mind that when you're making the loan application, most lenders are requiring that you provide payroll records. So if you have complete payroll records for 2019, those may be easier to submit than ones that just go to the 12 month period before the loan application. Uh, in addition, there's been some confusion as to whether payroll taxes can be counted. So do you use a gross number or some sort of net number? Uh, the statute is uh, ambiguous on this point. Uh, Senator Marco Rubio was on Squawk Box this morning explaining that it should be a gross number, at least that was the intent of the statute, and that he expects that a frequently asked questions document will be, will be uh, released at some point today or tomorrow from the Treasury addressing some of these questions. Uh, we already mentioned that the PPP loan proceeds can be used for a narrow purpose to retain workers, essentially, uh, mortgage interest payments, rent, and utilities. Uh, there is a forgiveness feature that uh, Joe Santor will discuss, but essentially you have to apply for forgiveness. Uh, you can start applying for forgiveness 60 days after you take out the loan. Uh, so the key points of the loan are that it's you know 1% interest rate, it's a two-year loan term, uh, does not require personal guarantees or collateral, and does not require your company to be profitable. Uh, the question is that's come up is where can you apply to get this loan? And our advice is you most certainly should go to your current banking relationship. There's been different uh, guidelines set up by the banks, whether you need to have an existing credit facility with the bank, or if it's sufficient that you just have a bank account. Uh, the issue for the banks is that you still need to meet as the bank, the, the, the Bank Secrecy Act for your customer requirements. So they wanna work with uh, borrowers that they're already familiar with. Um, so that becomes uh, an issue. It seems uh, that every day the loan is gonna be opened up for a broader cohort of people. So I would keep checking bank with, back with your banking relationships uh, and see if they are accepting loan applications. Uh, I would briefly like to discuss the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, which works in concert but separately from the PPP program. Under that program, you can borrow up to $2 million. Uh, and because the president declared a national disaster with respect to COVID-19, you can now uh, apply for EIDL loans. The loan amounts are up to $2 million. Uh, the interest rate is 3.75% for small businesses, 2.75% for nonprofits. Uh, it requires no personal guarantee for loan amounts uh, below $200,000. So you would need to guarantee the loan if it gets above that threshold. 
The eligibility is similar to the PPP program. You need to have 500 or employees. Uh, one question that's come up is whether you can apply both for the EIDL loan and the PPP loan. The answer is yes, but you cannot use the proceeds for the same uh, purposes. So under the EIDL program, there's a broader set of permissible uses for the loans, including paying outstanding payables uh, and dealing with supply chain interruptions, uh, which may give you a little bit more flexibility. In addition, uh, the CARES Act added a grant portion to the EIDL. So when you apply for an EIDL loan, you automatically are eligible for a $10,000 grant that has a narrower, narrower scope. You can use it for payroll and the same types of expenses that uh, you can use for the PPP. Uh, there's been some questions that have come up relating to how taking the loan affects other potential loan covenants you have with lenders. You may know that uh, when you borrow money, there's negative covenants that prohibit you from borrowing money from other people. Uh, in our experience, uh, existing lenders should be receptive because the loans are unsecured and are forgivable. And it may be that the loan actually enhances the credit worthiness of a borrower because one of the permissible applications is loan interest for existing loans. Uh, and in general, our view is that the SBA would be a general unsecured creditor of the borrower, so a secured uh, lender would have preference. Uh, that's it for the uh, survey of these two loan programs. Back to you, uh, George. Thanks, Adi. Uh, we're going to turn it over now that we've talked about the federal programs. And again, we'll have questions at the end. I'm sure Adi's going to be fielding a lot of them. I want to turn it over to my colleague, Bob White. Bob is a shareholder in our corporate and technology and entrepreneurial practice group in the Fort Lauderdale office. He's going to talk about the state of Florida loans, specifically the Florida Bridge Loan and the Rebuild Florida Business Loan uh, programs that are available here in the state of Florida. Bob? Thank you, George. Make sure I'm off mute here. You it's are. The state of, yeah, the state of, well, thank you. The state of Florida has stepped up a little bit. They've had, they don't have any specific programs, uh, new programs that are designed to help here, but they've got some older programs and existing programs, mainly arising out of hurricane damage that actually were uh, uh, maybe useful to people here, mainly useful for smaller companies and smaller situations. The most relevant program and probably the most useful and easy to attain program is called the Florida Emergency Bridge Loan Program. This, there's $50 million allocated to this program just for COVID-19 problems, so there's definitely some money available. Uh, the problem with it is, among other things, it's, it's uh, restricted right now to a $50,000 loan, and it's definitely a loan. The state has made gone taking great pains on its website to state that these are loans and not grants. They're not forgivable, and there's no, at least so far, there's no indication they will become forgivable going forward. Uh, don't know what's going to happen there, but I think you need to look at this as strictly a loan. The advantages of it are it's a one-year unsecured and interest-free loan, so it's interest-free financing for a year. There is some indication that the state would entertain requests for up to a hundred thousand, but the official limit is fifty thousand. You know, to require to request a hundred thousand, you'd have to do it as some kind of special circumstances. Now, these loans are broadly available to Florida businesses. You have to have been formed prior to March 9th of this year, so there's that. But you have to be a, a for-profit, privately held company doing business in Florida with two to 100 full-time employees. So if you're in that range, you've got at least you're eligible on the first level for these loans. Real key here to obtain this uh, emergency bridge loan is really the idea that you've got to show clearly demonstrable harm that's due directly to COVID-19. Uh, and that's really the, the kind of an undefined term, but I mean, I think you can see what they're getting at here, and it's directly related to that. Now, the issue here from a historical standpoint, this program was started in connection with Hurricane Andrew way back in 1992 and really directed more toward hurricane damage, but they've Governor DeSantis has, has repurposed this for the COVID-19, and I think it fits very well. There are some ineligible industries, uh, any kind of illegal activities, kind of goes without saying. Uh, if you take a third of your revenues from, a, or you get a third of your revenues from illegal gambling, you're not eligible. Uh, or any kind of certain uh, other kind of uh, 
uh, escort services, things you might guess are not eligible for the loan, but everything else, there's no restrictions on business uh, other than those if you meet the uh, quantitative requirements. Uh, the deadline, the important thing here, I think, is the deadline for the application. Your application must be filed by May 8th of this year, which is coming right up, obviously. So I would encourage everyone to get out there, even though it's not huge and it's not a grant or anything like that, and there's no indication of forgiveness. It is clearly uh, you know, an interest-free loan for up to, five, up to $50 million for a year. So it really could help you uh, in a lot of different ways. The key here, though, if you're going to uh, if you're going to show demonstrable economic injury due to COVID, that's what you've got to do. You can have no existing bridge loans under this uh, program. You know that's one thing that would stop you from obtaining it, and you could have uh, and you've got to uh, really tie it to the demonstrable economic injury here. Uh, if you have any doubt about that, you want to clear that with the Department of, of Economic Opportunity up front to avoid any kind of fraud or other kind of problems later saying you got this loan for the wrong purposes. We strongly, strongly suggest and advise that you apply for this loan online. And we've got the website and application information on our website because that's clearly the way to do it. You'll be on hold forever if you try to call or you can do it you know, through a paper application and Federal Express it to the DEO, but it's not, uh, that's not the preferred way to go. I would prefer to you know, advise you to apply online and try to do it that way. So that's the best program and the most easily obtainable program. There's one program here that's more in the employment area. Uh, and uh, I apologize to Joe if I've stepped on anything he wants to talk about, but it's called the short time compensation program. And what this is, it provides situations where you're going to lay out, you're going to reduce the hours of your full time employees. The program may pay for part of their salary if you keep them on and keep them working. Now, there's certain quantitative requirements. You've got to have reduced the hours of at least 10% of your employees. Uh, these are only full-time employees, too. And you've got to reduce their working time uh, at least 10%, but not more than 40%. And it's only for full-time employees who have a certain number of hours they've got to work each, uh, each week. So if that's the case, then there may be a chance to get the state to pay uh, for the wages that they would have gotten for the time that their hours were reduced. Now, it's really more advantageous to the employee, but the advantages to the employer here are that you can certainly try to use this to transition into better times. If this is really going to be a short-term thing, this, this COVID problem, relatively short-term, then you can at least use this to bridge yourself to better times by having the state pay at least part of the wages of these people during the downtime. So you could keep these people on and then not have to go out and look for skilled or you know good employees or skilled employees when things get back to normal, whenever that may be. Uh, the program, you've got to apply as an employer with the state, and it's a one-year program in place for you. But it's certainly something to think about if you've got certain skilled employees that you want to try to keep on and you're, you're not, you want to keep them on without laying them off so you can just a uh, access them quickly when things get better. So there's that. There's a third program called the Rebuild Florida Business Loan Program, which, again, is a, it was started in connection with Hurricane Irma last year. It's less clear that this is going to be able to be used for COVID, but I wanted to throw it out there. There's $40 million in this program, and it, was, uh, it relates to loans of up to 500000 at market rates and under market terms uh, for long-term loans, like any other loans. Uh, there's no special circumstances, no forgiveness or anything like that. But these are mostly related to construction and industry, uh, construction, land purchases and things like that. But they might be able to be used for COVID. But the jury is still out on that one. We're waiting to hear from the state on what they want to do with this. So I would put that one third in line of these three Florida programs. If you're going in summary, if you're going to look at a Florida program here, I would definitely uh, concentrate on the emergency bridge loan program because that's the one that's dedicated to COVID. The funds are available. It's relatively easy application if you can get in, get online, and do it. And I think your chances of getting, you know, depending on your circumstances, if you meet the uh, requirements, I think the chances are pretty good. And it's an interest-free loan for a year. Be advised that the state has taken a bit of a hard line. They're saying if you don't pay it back in a year, the interest rate jumps to 12 percent. And they took the time to say they will use uh, normal collection processes to collect these loans if they're not repaid. Again, part of that relates back to hurricane damage, you know, and Andrew and other hurricanes. But uh, I think that's on, that's at least on the website right now. 
This is also like all the stuff we're talking about today. This is a very fluid situations, and I would strongly advise you to stay on our website and contact any of us here on this uh, webinar today or any of your other Gunster relationships if you want uh, to get the latest updates. That's it, George. Back to you. I'm going to turn it back over to Adi, who's going to talk about the tax relief provisions that are provided for in the CARES Act. Adi? Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll briefly go over the you know, main uh, areas of change in the CARES Act that are taxpayer favorable and employer favorable. Uh, the first one is the employee retention credit. So the employee retention credit is not available if you apply for the PPP loan, but if you are a business that for whatever reasons, uh, employment number thresholds or other issues decide not to take the PPP money, uh, this is something you should take a hard look at. Uh, there's three major requirements. Number one, you have to keep paying wages. Uh, number two, you have to be an eligible employer. And number two, you have to pay what are called qualified wages. So the credit is up to 50% of the qualified wages you pay capped at $10,000. So uh, you can essentially take a payroll credit of $5,000 uh, per, per employee for qualified wages. Uh, so who's eligible? An eligible employer means that you've had to partially close your business due to government orders or uh, you've had a significant decline in gross receipts, meaning 50% of the gross receipts uh, based on the same calendar quarter in a prior year. Um, if you have more than 100 full-time equivalents, the qualified wages are uh, wages for paid to people who are staying at home because of government closure orders. And if you have fewer than 100 employees, the qualified wages are either paid to employees not providing services because of a government order or because you've had a significant decline in business. Uh, the credit is refundable. It's applied to wages paid after March 12th and before January 1st of 2021. Uh, and you know, for businesses with a fairly large payroll, uh, this could be a, a nice benefit. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other. Uh, things to consider that I'll go through in, in fairly quick succession are a deferral of payroll taxes. So the employer's share of payroll taxes uh, can be deferred to be paid uh, either on December 31st, 2020, or uh, excuse me, any payroll taxes that need to be paid by the end of this year can be deferred to December 31st, 2021 and December 31st, 2022. Uh, you cannot get this benefit if you take uh, loan forgiveness under the PPP, uh, but the idea is to create uh, liquidity for employers uh, by providing this deferral. Uh, the other items and these next three items, I would encourage uh, you to contact your accountant and to go back and look through your tax returns and see if there were uh, things that this law changed that may free up cash for you in the form of refunds. Uh, one item is the way net operating losses, carrybacks are calculated. So now the act allows a five-year carryback of net operating losses arising in 2018, 2019, or 2020, uh, which means you can go back as far as 2013. Uh, so for businesses that in particular struggle this year, uh, there may be a way to file for refunds in prior years. Uh, there is also a, an access business uh, loss rule for sole proprietors and people receiving pass-through income. Uh, it used to be before this modification that this was capped at 500,000 for a married couple or 250, 250,000 for singles. Uh, the CARES Act eliminated this excess business loss rule. So if you were caught in that over the past, uh, this year and the past two years, uh, you may wanna revisit it and see if you can file a claim for refund. And finally, for businesses that uh, made significant leasehold improvements, either in 2018 or 2019, there was a glitch in the 2017 Act that did not allow you to qualify what was called qualified improvement property as 15-year property. What that meant was you could not take bonus depreciation 
and depreciate those uh, improvements uh, in the year you place them into service, you have to amortize them over 39 years. So this is a very beneficial change. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about uh, restaurant chains or businesses that made uh, improvements to their uh, leasehold property. Uh, this is one you should definitely go back if this applies to you and speak to your accounting team about how to get refunds uh, relating to these changes in the law. Back to you, George. Thank you. Last presenter today is my colleague, Joe Santoro. Joe is a shareholder and he's the head of our employment and labor uh, department in the West Palm Beach office. He's gonna speak about employment issues and considerations from the CARES Act uh, and additional labor and employment topics that are relevant for you dealing with the circumstances that we're dealing with. Joe? Thank you, George. Um, so look, at, at the end of the day, the entire purpose of this legislation is designed to uh, help employers maintain their employees and to keep them off of the unemployment rolls uh, so that hopefully when we all come out of this, uh, small businesses in particular will be able to restart uh, and pick up where they left off. So it's really intended to be a bridge that incentivizes companies, small businesses, to keep their employees on the payroll. So there are lots of employment issues that relate to that. And what I thought I would do, um, we've gotten a lot of questions over the past you know, five or six days, uh, particularly since the interim guidance came out from clients. What I thought I would do is talk to you about some of the questions that we've been getting, because I think uh, based on, on uh, the emails that we're receiving, some of you all may have the same questions. And the first one was, is how do you determine whether or not you meet the 500 employee maximum threshold? For example, when do you look at that? Do you look at it on the day that you're applying for the loan? Is there a look back period? Um, if you're a company, for example, that had 600 employees in January, but you laid off you know, 300 of those employees, are you able to apply for this loan? The answer is probably not. And we were hoping to get some guidance, some additional guidance in the interim uh, SBA rules and they did not address this topic, which has led us to conclude that existing SBA regulations on how you calculate the number of employees will be used. And those regulations provide that you look to the average number of employees over the preceding 12 months from the time the loan is applied for and you look, at, you look at that 12 month period and you look at your monthly average and that's gonna tell you whether or not you have less than 500 employees or you're qualified under this program. And that includes not only full-time employees, but part-time employees, leased employees that are employed through a PEO. Um, and uh, you also have to also consider the affiliation rules. Now we haven't talked to you a lot about the affiliation rules. It's probably the most difficult topic to address and one that um, you really need to take a hard look at if you have affiliated entities. But generally speaking, uh, employers that have affiliated entities that have some level of common control, you add those employees together. And if you're still under that 500 cap, uh, then you do qualify. As Adeem mentioned, there's a special exemption for food and accommodations business that have an NAICS code of 72. I would encourage you guys to go look. Uh, there's a link on the DOL's website. You can find out what your classification is and whether you fall under that. Because if you have that, then you can have more than four, 500 employees provided that they're not all at a single location. So that's, that's how you find out whether you have 500 employees or not. Well, I got a lot of questions last week about well, what if I already laid people off or put them on furlough? What does that mean? And, and how does that impact either my eligibility to receive this loan or the forgiveness? And the answer is it primarily rates, relates to forgiveness and how much of that loan is gonna be forgiven. Uh, there is nothing in this act that tells you you can't lay off employees, uh, that you can't reduce compensation for employees, that you can't uh, furlough employees. 
But if you do those things, it could impact how much of the loan that you borrow is forgiven. And there are three ways in which they're gonna be looking at this. And the first one comes from the most recent SBA guidance that we received, the interim, interim rules. And they've said quite clearly that in order to get any forgiveness under this program, you must allocate at least 75% of the borrowed proceeds to payroll costs. And regardless of the other uh, expenses that you're allowed to use the money for, you must spend at least 75% of the borrowed proceeds on payroll, which includes salary, wages, commissions, tips, uh, either uh, you, you know, either uh, general uh, reported tips if you're not operating or a good faith estimate if you're gonna be paying people tips they would otherwise earn, vacation pay, sick pay, any severance benefits that you might give employees, uh, the cost for healthcare coverage, retirement contributions. What is not included in that, and one person asked this question already, are payments to independent contractors. You cannot use these funds to pay independent contractors. And the logic behind that is independent contractors can apply themselves for the benefit uh, under this program. So uh, be careful, you can't use the money uh, to pay independent contractors and have that forgiven. It also, other things that are excluded under the program is you can only use it to pay US-based employees. And you cannot use it for, uh, you don't get forgiveness for ex expenses over $100,000 for highly compensated employee employees. And you cannot use it uh, to offset federal employment taxes or other required obligations of the employer under the Families First Act, which we've been talking about for the last two weeks. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're taking the credit under the Families First Act, you cannot get a double credit by using these funds to uh, pay your employees and have it forgiven. So there is more guidance coming on forgiveness, but the threshold uh, issue is you've got to spend at least 75% of the money on payroll costs. Now, what are the other issues that you have to look at? Well, under the Act, and again, there's no guidance on this yet, there's an individual analysis done for your employees. Meaning if you do retain an employee, but you have reduced their salary, then you cannot receive forgiveness for any amounts that you have reduced their salary below 75% of what their prior wages were before the loan was taken. So you can have a reduction of up to 25% for an individual that works for you. But if you drop below that, the amount you drop below that is not forgivable. So you look at the employees themselves. And then the final one is headcount. So in addition to those, uh, what the department's gonna look at is it's gonna look at your full-time equivalent employees during this covered period. And it's gonna do a, a, a look back, uh, either depending upon which one is appropriate, either the same period of time back in 2019 or the period from January uh, 2020 through February, 2020, and they're going to look at your headcount. And if you have uh, uh, fewer employees presently than you did during that period, it's going to impact the amount of the forgiveness that you're going to receive. It's going to be some fraction. And actually, there's been a couple of articles uh, in the last 24 hours that there's actually a mistake in the act about how that's that's to be calculated, but we're pretty comfortable that the uh, guidance that's gonna be issued by the department is going to uh, address that. So now you know what you can forgive and can't forgive, what do you have to do to make sure that you uh, keep your head count high uh, in terms of being able to get loan forgiveness? Well, for those of you that have been already carrying your employees, have them working from home, haven't laid anyone off, uh, haven't furloughed anyone, it's easy. You just you get the funds and you use those funds to pay those employees as you have been doing. But for furloughed employees or employees that have been terminated, what do you need to do? Well, the answer is if you have furloughed employees, you have to immediately reinstate them. Now, I've gotten a lot of questions over the past couple of days that say, well, Joe, um, I, I can't wait. 
I've got, you know, I don't have the money to pay my employees for the next two weeks while I'm waiting for this loan to come in. Can I furlough them? Can I lay them off? The answer to that is yes. And the department will forgive you and allow you to get uh, the credit as long as you rehire those employees prior to June of uh, this year. So if you have no choice and you've got to do something dramatic like that, uh, it's okay to do that, but you, if you want the full loan forgiveness, you're going to have to rehire those employees. Uh, if you're an essential services provider, it's easy. Uh, you can bring all of those employees back and have them work. But what if your business is shut down? Uh, you know, how do you rehire people if you're not actually functioning? Well, the good news is, and I, I think this was contemplated when they drafted this, there's no requirement whatsoever in the act that you people are actually working. What is required is that you're paying them. So uh, you can go ahead and let people stay at home, use the money that you get under the loan program to pay them to stay at home, and that is perfectly acceptable as long as the money is going to uh, your employees. Whether they're working or not is not required. What about the employees that have been laid off or you terminated them and they're either on unemployment or they've taken another job, what do you do then? Well, it's actually a very interesting issue because if, if you have an employee that you've laid off who is on unemployment and you notify them that you have their job for them, that you're going to rehire them, that would render them ineligible for continued benefits under the federal unemployment program. So what we are telling clients is get a letter out to because you have to make the decision early on if you're going to take this money, you've got to get your workforce paid so that you can meet the uh, you know the number of requirements in order to have it forgiven. So if you've already laid off a lot of employees, we're telling clients to go ahead and send out a letter to all of your people that you want to rehire and saying, hey, good news, we got some uh, we were able to borrow money under this federal program. We're reinstating you. Uh, we're going to put you back on the payroll. And then if that employee decides not to come back or tries to stay on the federal unemployment because they make more money that way, then your offer of reemployment would disqualify them from being able to continue to get benefits under that program. So it's a little bit of a, a tough situation. And some employers have uh, discussed with us, well, maybe I don't want to take this loan because I want to help my employees out and I can cover the, the minimal overhead cost and leave them on the federal unemployment assistance. And that's just a decision that you'll have to make. But if you do take the money and you do offer them a job back, they are no longer qualified. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, you, you have to basically make a choice. You, know, you have to make a choice between whether or not, you know, you wanna enable your employees to continue to stay on the unemployment program uh, or whether you want to bring them back on and try to gain the benefit of the additional 25% of the funds that you can borrow that you can use for you know, other appropriate purposes, such as rent and utilities and, and the like. So uh, some employers are really struggling with that because they have employees that are compensated at a lower rate and they're actually doing better on the unemployment program. And keep in mind that this assistance is only for an eight week period where the unemployment assistance goes through the end of July. So it's actually uh, the $600 credit that they'll get under the federal unemployment assistance is actually uh, a little, lasts for a little bit longer. So as far as the unemployment piece of this, I mean, this is probably more relevant to the employees that, that you've laid off uh, and not the businesses themselves, but the benefits are available to anybody who is exhausted their regular state benefits or is receiving those state benefits and they get $600 on top of what they're already receiving under the state unemployment program, but they still have to meet the same fundamental requirements for unemployment that they would under, under the state program. I mean, like I said before, if they're eligible for benefits, if they're not eligible because there's a job available to them, then they're not gonna receive the federal benefit as well. Uh, the key for employers is, is that even though these federal benefits are available, they are not going to be charged to the employer like the state unemployment benefits are charged. So um, 
it's really a, a good thing uh, if you decide not to take the loan and you decide to leave your employees on this federal assistance program that uh, you won't have to be charged for that. The government, the federal government uh, pays all of the costs associated with that. And that's, uh, that's it for now. There's lots of questions which I'm sure we'll have a chance to answer. Joe, appreciate that. We do have a lot of questions. Uh, we've gotten about 75 questions that have come in here during this webinar. We will not be able to answer all of them online, although many of them do cover the same topic. So I want to turn it back over to Adi uh, first. We're getting a lot of questions about self-employed individuals with respect to the PPP program and whether or not as a self-employed individual or a sole proprietor, uh, how does this work, if at all? Adi? Yeah, so there's a, a couple of concepts to unwrap here, one of which uh, Joe Santoro already alluded to, which is in counting your payroll costs as an applicant, you cannot count what you're paying independent contractors because the concept is that independent contractors uh, can apply on their own. Uh, so that answers part of the question and I should note that uh, the uh, SBA and the banks are opening up the lending program for self-employed people this coming Friday. Uh, the more complicated issue is what if you have a partnership where the partnership pays uh, profits or distributes profits to an owner that cannot be on payroll? How is the self-employed employment uh, compensation to a partner work? There, I think the better answer is that that kind of compensation should be rolled in with the payroll calculations for the partnership. So you take all the workers for the LLC partnership and you take the self-employment income of the partner that cannot be on payroll, and that would be the base for a partnership. So there's a little bit of nuance there. The other thing I would address quickly is there's a question about uh, professional employment organizations, a lot of applicants are gonna have their payroll managed by a third party. Uh, and in those instances, I believe, I've not seen authority on that, is that you would count the payroll that the PEO is managing for you as the payroll costs for determining how much you can borrow. Thank you, Adi. Let me turn this one to Joe. I think this touches on the last thing that you were speaking about, Joe. Question is, we currently are continuing with no layoffs and have applied for the triple P loan. Understand the forgiveness period is eight weeks after the loan origination date. After this eight weeks, if we must, would layoffs or furloughs hurt us in regard to the triple P loan? So the answer to that question is, uh, is really uh, about when you apply for forgiveness of the loan. I mean, if you are employing those people for the eight week period and you uh, use the loan proceeds to keep them employed. But then after that eight week period, uh, you don't have a choice because you didn't come out of it or you, you have to reduce staff because things haven't turned around, then you would be able uh, to lay those people off uh, without um, impacting, as far as we know right now, until the new uh, guidance is issued, without impacting forgiveness. As long as you use the funds to keep them employed for the eight-week period, you should be okay. Thank you, Joe. Adi, we have a question about the EIDL program and the Triple P loan. Uh, the question is, can you apply for both, and does uh, applying for both or getting both affect the other one? Uh, we think the best answer is you can apply for both. Uh, the question that's come up is how you apply the loan proceeds after the loan is funded. The guidance we've seen says you can't use both loan proceeds for the same purposes. So as I mentioned during my earlier remarks, you could use the EIDL loan for some broader purposes than the PPP loan. Uh, for instance, you can use it to pay uh, payables, uh, you can deal with supply chain issues in addition to the items that uh, the PPP loan uh, can is available for. In addition, uh, you may be able to apply the EIDL loan for a period longer than the PPP loan. So you could use it for different payroll periods than you do for uh, PPP. 
but you know, long story short, there needs to be coordination if you do borrow both uh, under both programs. Uh, one additional point is if you've already borrowed under the EIDL, there's an opportunity to refinance your EIDL loan into a PPP loan, uh, which I think causes the confusion about whether both loan programs are available. And indeed, can you apply for an EIDL loan with one bank and the triple P loan with another bank? Well, interesting. Uh, the EIDL loan is actually, you apply for that through the SBA. It's a direct application through a portal with the SBA, uh, whereas the PPP loan is uh, applied through the banking system. Uh, so I think that resolves the question. You would go online to sba.gov and look for the EIDL program, and there's a portal there to apply for the EIDL loan. Thank you. Joe, we have a question uh, about using a company that uses third-party vendors. Uh, this might be tied into the independent contractor question, but example, lawyers, CFO, brokers, can they be added, uh, can they be add them in as third-party employees, I guess, for purposes of the triple P? Uh, the answer from the most current guidance from the DOL appears to be no. Uh, if and, and the logic behind that is the independent contractors like that, people that you're paying on a 1099 that are contractors or vendors, have the ability to apply themselves. And so they're not going to be included uh, either in the measure of how much you can borrow, and they're not going to be, if you do make payments to independent contractors, that amount is not going to be forgivable use. Uh, D, we have a question about a country club. We know that not-for-profits are eligible under the Triple P program, but this country club is set up as a 503C7, and they understand that they don't apply, although they hear other clubs are applying. Can you give any guidance as to whether or not they would be eligible? Uh, so the definition of non-profits that let me take a step back. So the PPP program expanded the eligible businesses to include nonprofit businesses. And nonprofit businesses are specifically defined as 501c3s. So it would seem to me that C7s are excluded. Uh, the other issue you might have as a nonprofit is, or a club, is you still have to figure out under the SBA regulations whether you're an eligible business and some private clubs are excluded uh, as eligible businesses uh, under the program. Thanks, Adi. We got a question about what type of documentation a company should provide in support of their certification. We had talked about that during the call uh, and the reasons why you would do that. And the reason is, is that under the Triple P program, there's a certification in the application uh, where you have to say current economic uncertainty makes this loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the applicant. So what we advise is that you document why you're in an economic situation that shows that you need this loan. Uh, there's going to be some look back after this is all said and done by the federal government. If we look back at the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, there certainly was uh, the federal government after it was all over went back and looked at you know, how that situation unfolded. We expect that by loaning out $350 billion, there's gonna be oversight on this on the back end. So we recommend that you document why your company needs this loan in order to be able to continue ongoing operations. Uh, and I think there's a lot of ways you can do that based upon how the pandemic is impacting your business. So that's a document worth having and having in your file in case there is any review after. Adi, the next question is for you. There's a question about if the triple P loan, if you do receive the forgiveness and it ends up being more of a grant than a loan, is there any tax consequences to that, to the company, to the shareholders? Uh, no, the, the, actually the act is very clear that the forgiveness portion of the PPP is not considered a discharge of debt for income tax purposes. So. Uh, add this to another of the reasons why it's such a, a great program and, and uh, one that has uh, generated so much interest. We talked about foreign uh, employees not being eligible for the act, but Joe or Dee, can you speak to whether a foreign-owned business 
uh, is eligible for either the triple P or the EIDL. I'll take this one, George. Uh, so the, 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 there's not a clear answer on this point. Uh, we've, we've taken a look internally about affiliation and whether foreign affiliates uh, and their workforces are combined with uh, domestic workforces for purposes of eligibility. Uh, you know, it'd be helpful to have more guidance from the Treasury on this point, but the Act does seem to focus on American workers, workers with a principal place of residence in the United States. So notwithstanding foreign ownership, I think if you have a U.S. business with a U.S. payroll, uh, my view would be that you'd be eligible. Thank you, Dean. Question on whether employer matching FICA Medicare expenses would be included in payroll costs. I'll take this one too. Uh, so I alluded to this uh, during my earlier remarks. Uh, so the question is, when you look at payroll, do you look at gross or do you look at net? If we get a little more technical, uh, since you're looking back at payroll from 2019 or the past 12 months, a technical reading of the statute would indicate that you can include payroll costs, including uh, FICA, in your payroll costs for determining the loan amount. Uh, but oddly, those would not be available uh, for forgiveness if you spend uh, some of the loan proceeds on payroll taxes. Uh, I mentioned uh, I saw uh, Senator Marco Rubio this morning on Squawk Box. He highlighted this as a, a, a problem, a glitch that needs to be fixed. Uh, and I suspect uh, we'll get either guidance from the Treasury or some uh, cleanup down the road on this point. Joe, we had a question about uh, companies that have already laid folks off um, and not, not necessarily because of COVID, but just because of reorganization, other business reasons, but did so you know, this year in 2020. What, what impact, if any, is that going to have on their application for the Triple P or their ability to have it forgiven? Uh, well, it's it's primarily going to impact if the terminations were more recent. It's primarily going to impact uh, their ability to have it forgiven. Because remember, what happens is if you take the loan, there's going to be a look back period. One of the measures they're going to look at is your headcount. They're going to look at your full time equivalency during the uh, the year before during the same covered period, or from January through February 29th. And they're going to look at what your what your FTE was before and what it is at the end of the loan program. And if you had a reduction, uh, you may end up borrowing more money than you have employees to support. So you may end up, you know. And what I've heard is they're they're lim they're they're making you take the two two hundred fifty percent of payroll. Like the banks are putting every loan in at that amount. So you may end up borrowing more money. Uh, then you ultimately can use for payroll. So you got to be careful about that. Another question for you, Joe. Uh, is it true that startups, you know, that weren't really in business in 2019, would they have the ability to obtain anything under these programs or were they out of luck? No, as long as you were in business on February 15th, 2020, you're technically technically eligible uh, if you haven't been in business for the full year, then what they'll look at to determine the amount of money you can borrow is the, you know, the preceding, the average of the preceding months uh, when you were in business. So as long as you're in business on February 15th, 2020, you should be eligible to take the loan. There are a lot of questions about whether the money is going to run out or whether banks have been capped on how much they're about to lend. We've saw some press today about Wells Fargo not accepting any new applications. Can, Adi, can you speak to that point? You know, I've seen the same uh, information you've seen. Uh, it does seem, and I think indications are uh, from the SBA and the Treasuries that this program will run out. Uh, it's clear in the interim final guidance that it's first come, first served. So to the extent uh, you think you want to benefit or take out the loan, I think uh, you need to move fairly quickly in evaluating what you're going to do. Uh, but in addition, 
there's been indications that there'd be uh, strong recommendations from both, uh, and I know the president tweeted about this over the weekend, that additional money could be appropriated uh, once the initial $349 billion runs out. Yeah, there is. And I know that uh, Speaker Rubio has mentioned last week that he thinks that the program should be continued and amplified. And uh, Speaker Pelosi has agreed with Senator Rubio on that. So I think there is an op opportunity and potentially an opportunity for Congress to come back uh, when they do a phase four and to extend these programs. A uh, couple more questions before we conclude for, t for today. Question about a, a pharmacy that has two main employees. They pay a couple hundred thousand dollars per year. So far, the business is down only about 25% in total business. Can they still apply for the triple P loan? I think the answer is yes. Uh, I think the program works actually particularly well for uh, businesses that have suffered some reversal but are still operating. Uh, in a way to tie you over uh, to meet certain expenses. I think what you have to think about is, you know, we've been repeating this, but the certifications you're making on the loan application is the essence of this question. If your business uh, hasn't really suffered, you have su sufficient wherewithal within the business, I'll emphasize within the business, uh, to keep operations going for an extended period of time, uh, there may be an issue uh, with how you feel about certifying the things that the application requires you to certify. Let's take a couple more and then we're going to conclude. Again, if you have any questions, you can submit those questions directly to us. We have uh, on our website uh, more information about COVID-19 and all of the business and law policies. That's at www covid forward slash covid19 but you can also send us questions at covid19 at gunster.com g-u-n-s-t-e-r.com joe as companies rehire people or if they furloughed people they bring them back or even if they're newly hiring people as we recover how is that going to impact the uh, triple p calculations for forgiveness so um there is an express provision in uh, the, the Triple P Act that confirms that if you rehire people, as long as you rehire them by June, if you've laid them off and, and furloughed them, as long as you rehire them by June, uh, the end of June, that it's not going to impact from a headcount perspective, your ability to have loan forgiveness. So it's, it's trying to encourage you to rehire people. So it's, it's okay to do that. In fact, they're, the government's encouraging you to bring your workforce back. Okay, well, I think we've covered a lot of the questions that you've asked. A lot of the questions were on the same topics. As I mentioned before, uh, we're, we're over our time, but we wanted to get to as many as possible. If you have questions that you would like to ask, you can ask those questions directly uh, by going to our a dedicated email that we mentioned before, uh, the COVID-19 at gunster.com. That's COVID-19 at gunster.com to answer any of those questions or just go to our website at www.gunster forward slash COVID-19 where we have a lot of this information, including this webinar, which will be available tomorrow. If you would like to listen to it again or forward it to any of your colleagues or friends, we really appreciate you being with us here today as we try to navigate the CARES Act it's a tremendous piece of federal legislation to help small business owners. We know it's a little bumpy and that there's some uh, difficult issues out there. That's why we had this webinar today to provide you with as much information as we could. Thank you so much. Good luck out there. We're going to get through this and we're here to answer any questions that you have. Have a great day.